With that said, let's look at verse 12 first, and then I'm going to pick up at verse 13 and take you to verse 15. But we'll begin with looking just at verse 12, James chapter 5, verse 12. And James says this, Above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. And so as we begin, we'll look at that verse by itself. Then we'll pick up at verse 13 and take those verses together. But uh, w what we have here is James giving last instructions to the churches. And so he begins to conclude with an exhortation. And the exhortation is for them to have something called integrity. You see, one of the qualities of a believer that has great impact on the world that we live in is the quality of integrity. Integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. The word integrity has been defined as the state of being whole and undivided. And so he's beginning here in verse 12 as he's concluding to say, Above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Let your yes be yes, your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. He's beginning with an exhortation for them to have character, to have integrity. You see, he's closing this section with this exhortation because a person's speech clearly reveals their spiritual condition. The things that you say are simply produced by your heart. And when you speak, you're giving a glimpse of what's going on inside of you. In Matthew 12, 34 and 35, Jesus said it like this. He said, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Jesus simply made it clear. He said, what proceeds out of your mouth is revealing your character. Now, James has already spoken concerning this. He alluded to it in, in chapter 1, verse 26, when he said, If anyone among you thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So straightforward and honest speech reveals integrity. His, his, his word here in verse 12 is uh, avoid false oaths and avoid evasive speech. He says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. In other words, be of such integrity that your word is respected as being true and dependable. Let your word stand firm and be careful to keep it when you give it. When my mother uh, when my father uh, went to heaven, my mother moved to, to New Mexico. And, um, you know, she was an older woman when this all was taking place, and it was difficult for her to be uprooted. She was born in, and raised in California. It was difficult for her to be uprooted in the first place, to lose her husband, and then to, to move into a new state. And she moved into New Mexico. Some of you perhaps are from New Mexico. Well, I know we have members of our church who are from New Mexico and all, or perhaps you have relatives who live there. I have relatives uh, to this day who live in New Mexico. And also my mom moved over to, uh, to New Mexico, and, and I was asking her, how, how is your adjustment uh, coming along, Mama? How's it, how is it for you in New Mexico? And she said, I'm having a tough time. And I said, well, I'd assume that you are. She says, well, you know, it's not just the, everything that goes into the moving. She says, it's, it's, I'm having a tough time getting used to the New Mexican people. And I said, oh, really? In what way? She goes, well, she goes, you know that saying, manana? I said, yeah. She says, that's real. <laughs> and I go, well, what do you mean? She says, she says, well, if you tell somebody, can you come and work on my house? And they'll say yes. And she'll say, can you come at 10 o'clock? And they'll say, be there at 10. She says, David, she says, 10 o'clock comes, 11 o'clock comes, 12 o'clock comes, 1 o'clock comes, and they never come. She says, they, they don't keep their word here. She says, I was used to people from where I'm around. If they said they're going to be there, they'd be there. She says, but I'm having a tough time adjusting to this because it's a very real cultural thing. They'll tell you I'll be there. And then when you call them and say you were supposed to be here at at noon, and I've been waiting. They'll say, oh, you know, something came up, and I'll be there. And then they don't show up then either. Well, you know, James is talking to us, and this is Christians. We're not talking about just people. We're talking about people who, who claim to know the Lord. Well, James is saying, no, your yes has to be yes, and your no should be no. And don't say yes when you intend to say no. 
It's like the guy who calls up the girl and says, I'd like to take you out. And she says, well, I'd love to go out with you, but I'm, I'm going to wash my hair that night. Okay, how about the next night? Well, I think the next night I'm going to have... And then she's got all this list of reasons. Instead of just saying, no, you're ugly. She, I don't want to go out with you. I'll never go out with you, ugly. No, just be real. Just say, no, I don't want to go out with you. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Have integrity. Uh, and, and he says also, notice this, he goes, um, do not swear, verse 12, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. In other words, be of such integrity that your word is respected as being true and dependable. In other words, let your word stand firm and be careful to keep it when you give it. In Matthew 5, 37, Jesus said it like this. He said, let your yes be yes, your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. We need to remember God is the God of truth. Your word should be good enough if you're a Christian. Christians of all people are to be the most honest. Of all people, we should have the most integrity. Somebody said the pinnacle of a man's greatness is the height of his own character. And Proverbs 22, 1 says a good name is more desirable than great riches. So there was an old saying, it's a saying that I don't hear anymore, but they said, his word is his bond. Our yes, in other words, is yes. And when we say no, we really mean no. Because in this world, believers are to be known for character and integrity. Paul said in Romans 12, verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing, and perfect will. So God's desire is for us to have integrity. God's desire is for us as believers to keep our word because that reveals that we truly are children of God because our God doesn't lie. Warren Wearsby, an author, uh, I've read his devotionals and things over the years, wrote in a book called The Integrity Crisis, something I think is worth repeating at this point. Warren Wearsby said, for centuries... The church has been telling the world to admit its sins, repent, believe the gospel. Today, the world is telling the church to face up to her sins, repent, and start being the true church of that gospel. We Christians boast that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but perhaps the gospel of Christ is ashamed of us. Because of the failure of many Christians to be Christ-like, the church is losing credibility. And if we lie about little things, then who's going to believe us when we give them the gospel? There are those who say, I won't attend church because it's filled with insincerity and hypocrisy. So somebody said, the church is like Noah's Ark. If it, if it weren't for the judgment on the outside, you could never stand the smell on the inside. And so we as the church need to be the church. We need to be people of integrity. We need to seek the Lord. We need to be careful to pursue Him daily. We need to keep a close watch over our own lives. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So we pray, and we decide, we're going to walk closely to the Lord. And, and the psalmist said it like this in Psalm 86.11. He said, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And so he begins here by just saying, let your yes be yes and your no, no. He said, lest you fall into judgment. You would fall into judgment for making an oath and not keeping it. So he says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Be people of integrity. Keep your word. If it's yes, then yes, then follow through. If it's no, then it's no and follow through. So just have integrity. But now he moves on into verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins... 
you'll be forgiven. Now I'm going to preface this portion. We're going to be looking at four things, suffering, singing, sickness, and sin. That's what we're going to be looking at in verses 13 through 15. But let me preface this. Let me introduce this by, by just sharing something with you that is, is rather, it's rather personal, but it'll, it may help you understand how I'm going to be approaching this and what you may see um, emotionally that can come out of me. First service was a tough service for me, so I thought I'd better explain some things to the second service. That way you're not surprised if you see me well up with tears or you hear the emotion that I feel. If I'm open with you like I was first service, that, that very well may happen. Uh, you know, just, just this last two weeks, my wife and I have, have um, we've, we've gone through uh, emotions with others uh, that, that had been very touching to us. And so my heart is, is raw, to be honest with you. We attended the memorial service for, for a baby six days old that went to be with Jesus. We, were part, we attended that service. And, and a, a brother in our fellowship who went on to help uh, to begin a new church in Montclair served here for 22 years. I attended his memorial service just yesterday. I was in the hospital on Friday to visit one of the members of our church that has been serving the Lord here since 1992. And he's, he's not doing well at all. And while we were there, uh, somebody approaches. My son, actually, Joseph, works at this hospital. And Joseph came and approached me and said, Dad, there's another uh, couple from our church who's here right now, just a few places, you know, a few rooms over. And, and so we're there with somebody very dear to me who is uh, not doing well at all. And then we just go to another room. And so these things have been happening. My heart is raw. Forgive me for the emotion. I'm apologizing in advance. So this is about sin and sickness and suffering. And as I'm going through it, my heart is touched by people I know by people I'm seeing right now hurting. And, and we, we, when one person in the body hurts, the whole body hurts. And as a pastor, I would not be a true shepherd if my heart didn't get touched by the pain that I see my sheep in. Forgive me, because I don't like to come and weep. I get embarrassed that I actually show emotions. I, 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 I don't want to, but the word is it's going through me is revealing myself to me, even as I teach to you. And I'm broken right now. My heart is sad. So forgive me. It's not that I don't have hope. God is my hope. But we weep with those who weep, as well as rejoicing with those who rejoice. So I know you didn't come to church to watch the weeping pastor. I know that. But I'm just, I'm just giving you an announcement. This is, this, is, this is one of those messages that has, is tearing my heart as I speak. So please forgive me for the emotion, and I'll do my best to become tough, but I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm just a weakling. I, I show my heart. My dad used to say, you know, that's your biggest problem, David. You're, you, you're just too open. But it's also my greatest blessing, because I don't want to hide from you what God does in my life. And so that's who I am. You know, thank you, thank you for your kindness. Um, you know, Friday I celebrated, if you will, my 49th anniversary of coming to faith in Christ. And, and I'm, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. But over the 49 years, can you imagine the amount of tears and sorrow that, that I and my wife, Marie, that we have encountered uh, together? And so sometimes those things come out when I teach. Sometimes... Those emotions are raw, and I haven't had time yet to let them settle so that I can have control. And it's because there's one thing after another, after another, and it's been waves that are pretty serious, and, and they deeply affect me. And so I say that to you so I can get into this study and blubber like a fool for the next hour. Actually, no, I'm, I, just by telling you, I feel much better. Let's see what happens now, shall we? For, <laughs> verse 13 is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. 
And so we're going to look at suffering and singing. We're going to look at sickness and we're looking at sin. And as we do so, notice what he begins with. In verse 13, he says, is anyone among you suffering? And then he says, let him pray. When he says, is anyone among you suffering? The word suffering in the original language, uh, this New Testament was written in Greek. It was called Koine Greek, common Greek. It's the common language at that day. The word suffering means to be afflicted in any way. It speaks of enduring evil and hardship. Now, James has already approached this word in verse 10 of chapter 5 when he said, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So he's already re referred to suffering in James 5 verse 10. And so suffering or being afflicted. So affliction and suffering, undergoing tribulation is part of following Christ. It's part of being a Christian. And Jesus prepared us for this. He, he prepared us to go through the afflictions and all. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Paul said, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So concerning affliction in the life of the believer, we know that we go through affliction. We know that we go through tough times, pressures, hardships. We know that, but we also know that, that God works through it. We know that affliction is not pointless, but is performing a work in our lives. In Romans 5, Paul said it like this. He said in verses 3 through 5, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope, make, hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And so there's a good thing, a, a thing that occurs as we go through these things, and God is working in all of it. And that's why later in Romans 12, verse 12, Paul will say, rejoicing in hope and patient in tribulation and continuing instant in prayer. For the Christian, times of affliction aren't pointless because it's the times that we go through affliction that we learn the deep lessons. It's the times that we go through affliction that we learn about the Lord. We see them as, as God working to purify our lives and, and, and through the afflictions and sufferings that we go through. And we do go through these things. God works and refines us. Isaiah 48, 10 says, I have refined you, but not as silver. I've tested you in the furnace of affliction. Afflictions. Afflictions prepare us to minister to others through what God has taught us. Have you ever said, Lord, make me like you in any way, shape, or form? Have you ever prayed and said, God, I want to be a better Christian. I, I, I want to be real. I, I want to be authentic. I I want to have a faith that's, that, that is, that is um, strong and solid. Um, part of the way that that happens is through the, the tough times you, you endure, the things that you go through. Have you ever said, Lord, I'd, I'd like a heart that cares for others? Well, part of the way that that takes place is your heart is broken. It's not testimony time for me, but I'll share one element of it. By the time I was 20 years old, just before I got saved, I was a pretty hardened person, very hard. I had gotten arrested for burglarizing a jewelry store when I was 18. And uh, a lawyer, my dad hired a lawyer, his name was Stanley Brown. He was from Beverly Hills. He sent me Christmas cards for years, hoping I'd get in trouble again. <laughs> Stanley H. Brown. <laughs> My dad hired him. My dad actually took a second out on our house to pay for this lawyer from Beverly Hills because I was going to do some prison time for burglary. I had stolen a felony amount of uh, diamond rings, and I got arrested. And I was... I still remember seated, being seated in my 
dad's uh, kitchen and Stanley Brown was looking at me and he looks at my dad and he says to my dad as he's looking at me, this, he said, this boy doesn't have a heart. This boy is hard. He doesn't have any sense of remorse because I was one of those kids, I still remember, I just would lean back, put my head back and, and that's the way I was. And my dad said, well, he's deep. No, I was deep in, in sin, it's what it was. I was hardened, I didn't care. I didn't care how people cried over me. I didn't care how I hurt them. I didn't care. If you said something to me that I didn't like, it didn't matter, I'd let you know I didn't like this, you know? And I'd say it in a mean and really rude and brutal way very often. And, and, and I actually took, took pride in being unkind. I took a certain, a certain pride in, in, in using my ability to communicate to make people feel stupid. I took a pride in that. And I still remember when I was supposed to go into the military, I had been drafted and, and I had uh, was supposed to go in August 25th. And uh, I went on and partied all night. I, I was drinking and uh, smoking dope and just loaded very loaded and I came in at three in the morning or so and got up at five and my dad was driving me to the induction center in Los Angeles and I came walking in two hours of sleep I was still 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 high still a little drunk and my mom was crying my dad was crying my two sisters were crying and and my dad was just standing with his arms folded looking at me and my mom says when your brother Frank went into the Navy he came and climbed in bed between your dad and me and cried because he was leaving home and you didn't even come home. And I said, so what? I said, I'm gone. I said, I'll be gone for two years. I said, you won't have to bother with me anymore. So what? That was my attitude. And they cried. My sister cried. My dad was angry. My dad gave me $10 back in 1970. $10 was a lot more then than it is now. And my dad gave me $10. And they dropped me off. He dropped me off at the induction center. I still remember just looking at my dad, climbing out and said, I'll see you. And I walked out. I had no emotions, no feelings, no heart, nothing. And I climbed out and I just went in with his $10. And they rejected me that day because of the burglary. And I had a friend of mine named Gary who was also rejected. And he had a lid. He had some marijuana. And he and I went out and smoked some pot. I bought him some breakfast, called a friend of mine, spent my dad's $10 treating him to a meal. I went home. I walked into the house. And my father looks at me and he said, you're supposed to be in the army. And I said to my dad, even Uncle Sam doesn't want me. And I laughed. And I went and slept it off in my room. That was me. That's how I was. I was cruel. I was mean. I had no heart at all. And if it hurt you, I don't care. Who do I care? Who are you? And that's, that was me. What do I care? And I got saved. And I said, God, break my heart. Break my heart. And he has for 49 years. And I finally have gotten to the place where I weep with those who weep. And I rejoice with those who rejoice. And I can tell you, it's the hard things in my life that have made me into what I am. And I wouldn't change a single thing other than I wish I could control my tears. I wish I could, but I can't, I can't, I can't. But he broke me. I am telling you, 49 years of experience, that affliction, that suffering, that hurting, changes you and makes you into what you want to be so that you actually care about other people, that you actually want to do good for other people. And that's how it works. And the Lord does that. It, and the afflictions that you go through, the suffering that we as a church, we as a body of Christ go through, well, when we go through these things, the, the afflictions prepare us to minister to others because we have been comforted by God and we can comfort others in the way he comforts us. In 2 Corinthians 1, 6, that's what Paul says. He says, if we are distressed, if we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. We go through things so that we can offer you things that we know God gave to us. Do you want to be a comforter to somebody else? You will be comforted. You will go through hard times. It's our, our times of difficulty that are the times that actually work to draw us closer to the Lord. In Psalm 119, 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. In Job 5, 17, it says, behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. 
Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. And so that helps us to understand the ways of the Lord. We go through affliction. We go through suffering. But what do we do? We pray. We seek the Lord. We ask God to help us. We, could, we say, God, strengthen us. God, deliver us. Uh, according to verse 9, the natural response is to complain. That's why he had said, do not grumble against one another. Our, our natural response is to complain. But instead of complaining and grumbling, what we do is we learn to pray. You see, prayer reveals our dependence on God and, and faith that he hears us as we cry. In Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalm 91, 15, he shall call upon me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. That's how you learn that. So you're going through pain, disappointment, hurt, rejection. You're a parent and your kid's not walking with God. You're, you're married and your marriage isn't doing well. You're having a tough time on the job. Something's going on. You went to the doctor for a routine physical, and it turns out there are things about you that you didn't realize were there. Conditions that you're just sitting there as the doctor's speaking, and you're unable to even process it. Like when I was sitting at the doctor's, and, and the doctor had given me so many tests, and and said, your condition is that if something doesn't change in seven years, you're going to be dealing with dementia. You'll forget everything. And I'm sitting there looking at the doctor say that to me, a man whose entire life is built on memory. And he's, she's telling me in seven years, you won't have a memory. And I go into my car and I sit there with my hand at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock and I wait for my wife to take care of the business that she has to take care of. She climbs in the car and sits next to me and I say, put me in a home. Put me in a home. I'm not going to have you taking care of me. I don't want to be that man who can't remember the name of his wife. Put me in a home. They had said in seven years I was going to lose my memory. They had done this testing on my front, frontal lobes and found calcification. The doctor had said, you've got seven years. That was when I was 58. And I turned 65. I don't have any problems. <laughs> and so I go back to the doctor who had told me that and I'm sitting there waiting for him to give me the final comments. And he says, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes we make mistakes. And we made a mistake this time. You're okay. There's nothing wrong with you. But you live with these things, guys. You live with these things. I live with these things. All of us do. All of us do. All of us. The longer you live, the more you deal with. The more disappointments, the, no, the more pains the more physical things you know, that you go through. That's just life. It's not a negative. It's reality. How do you deal with that? What do you do with it? For me, I've asked the Lord, help me to use whatever it is that is loaded on me to be of help to other people, to understand. And you want to have compassion? You're going to go through a place that's going to help you to have it. And so many of you are saying, I don't want compassion. I just want to be blessed. But I'm telling you, I wouldn't change anything because what the Lord does through these things is he not only delivers you, but he also equips you so that you can be a word of experience to somebody else. I went to a funeral, memorial service, a little fella who died within just a few days of his birth. And the young pastor got up and shared and gave a kind of a spiritual pep talk and and I'm an older man and I'm I've been through a lot of a lot of wars a lot of ministry for a long time 46 years 
done a lot of funerals, buried stillborn babies, buried suicides. I've been there, I've seen that, I've ministered to the families afterwards. And I'm watching this, and it's a pep talk. And Marie and I get in the car, and we're driving, and I said, he's a great communicator. He needs to develop a heart. He needs to develop a compassion because you're speaking to broken people and they don't need a pep talk. They need someone who will weep with them when they weep. They need somebody who knows how to journey when your eyes are so wet with tears and you don't know where you're going and your hands are just in front of you. You need someone who's able to walk with you. We're going to make it. We'll be okay. God is with us. We're not lost. He's at the end of this road. Hold on. We're going to make it. And that's how you get it, guys. That's how you get that. That's how you learn. When you're going through suffering, you pray. And you say, God, strengthen me. Enable me. Create in me your image so I can be a hand of help to somebody. So I'm not that person who just comes up and gives a quick scripture and then walks off. Because I want to not only rejoice with those who rejoice, but I want to learn to weep with those who weep. And, and, and if you want to be deep, you go through deep things. If you want to be strong, you're going to have your strength tested. And your body's going to be broken. And then you're going to discover that on your own you can't do it, but with Christ I can do all things. And you'll learn that success in Christ. That's what you learn. That's how it works. And I'm, I'm an old man talking to young people. Listen to me. It's true. You want to be strong? You'll be tested. You want to help people? You're going to need help. But you learn the ways of God that way, and you become a strong warrior for Jesus Christ. That's how it works. He draws us close to himself in that way. And so he says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. And so from one place, he goes to another. You see, in the life of a believer, singing and praising God is a response of a joyful, faith-filled heart. Singing psalms. When he speaks of singing psalms, a psalm is a song accompanied by a stringed instrument, like a harp or a guitar. So singing praises to God have always been part of true worship. We love to sing. We sing for all occasions. We sing all kinds of songs. But of all people, Christians have the best reason to sing. We have the best because we worship and praise our God. And, and when you read your Bible, the word praise is, is very commonly associated with, with our God. And in, and in the Psalms alone, the word praise is used 160 times. When we speak of praise, that speaks of adoration. It speaks of thanking God. And it's natural for us to do. So you see that all through the Psalms and through the Bible. Psalm 100, verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, bless his name. Hebrews 13, 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Just this morning as I awakened, there's a song in my heart, a, a song that was sung by Keith Green, and, and I'm just going over it the minute I wake up in the morning. It's, it's what you do as a Christian, is you worship and you praise God. Singing praise to God is, is, is something we do at all times, and it's not simply restricted to when things are going well. Think of Acts chapter 16. And, and remember that the Apostle Paul and his friend Silas were, were preaching the gospel in a city called Philippi. And while ministering, they encountered a demonized woman. And they cast that demon out, the scripture says. And when that happened, it outraged her masters. So they had Paul and Silas arrested for troubling the city. So the judges, the magistrates, ordered them beaten with rods. And they threw them in prison. And they fastened their feet in the stocks. They secured them so they couldn't escape. How did they react to this? They were out there preaching. They did a work in the name of Jesus. They set a woman free. And now they're just beaten up. And they're just, their bodies are so opened up. And they're, they're in such pain. And they're, they're chained in, in stocks. And, 
Well, what does it say? Acts 16, 25 says, At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. There they are, in that condition. Their bodies were restricted, but their spirit wasn't. And they worshipped God, and the people listened. And as this was taking place, there was a Philippian jailer who heard this taking place and, and came and began to speak to them and finally said to them, uh, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your household. Because he took them to, the, to his house and they preached the gospel to his family. So by their imprisonment and their praise, they were able to preach a gospel that set people free. And that's why Paul in Romans 8.28 could tell us this. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We know this because Paul had gone through that. In verse 14, the question is asked, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. So James now speaks of sickness. He's speaking about being weak or feeble, to be without strength, to be powerless. Obviously, being a believer doesn't insure us against illnesses. We live in a fallen world. We're subject to sicknesses like everybody else. In Scripture, faith-filled believers are mentioned as having to contend with illness. In 2 Kings chapter 13, verse, verse 14, the prophet Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. In the New Testament, Paul gave instructions to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 5, 23, he said, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. In 2 Timothy 4, 20, Paul said, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Paul himself suffered with various ailments. In 2 Corinthians 11.30, Paul said, If I must boast, I'll boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The word infirmity is translated illness, ailment, disease, or sickness. Many commentators say that Paul may have had trouble with his eyesight. You see it in Galatians in four, chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, where Paul said, My trial, which was in my flesh, you didn't despise or reject but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. And later in, in Galatians 6, 11, he says, See with what large letters I've written to you with my own hand. Large letters gives us a clue that he was writing and he couldn't really see the letters that he was forming. And so it's commonly believed that he had uh, an eye ailment that caused him to, to lose sight. Uh, he couldn't see properly or clearly. It would seem that he, he needed a, a physical healing for his eyesight, but it doesn't say that he received it. Now, I say that just to say that a believer can be sick, a believer can be ill, but that doesn't mean that we don't ask God to touch our bodies. We do. We ask the Lord, and that's what verse 14 tells us. It says, if anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So when a Christian is sick, may that Christian ask for prayer. When a believer has been undergoing affliction and is weak, they need prayer. And notice how James says, call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him. So you call. You call for one of the church leaders. In the doing of that, you're demonstrating faith. But they do this. They pray over him in faith, believing that the Lord can heal him. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And so they pray in faith, trusting the Lord. And then they anoint him with oil. When you read your Bible, you note that oil represents medicine as well as the Holy Spirit. And so there's a combination of the two thoughts there when you anoint with oil, because in one form, medicine, oil was looked at as medicine. You see that in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 34, when the Samaritan found this person who had been injured on the road, and, and it says that he had 
he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And so that was medicinal. But you also know that, that, that the Holy Spirit is often uh, spoken of as the, uh, 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 the oil. It, it represents the Spirit. We know that prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil. And so when you pray for them, you pray anointing them, symbolizing medicine, but also an awareness of the one who does the healing. And he says, and the prayer, verse 15, of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. The prayer of faith is another way of saying prayer offered up in faith. Such prayer is evidencing a confidence in God, God who, who heals and a God who saves. Now, when he says in verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick, the word save is an interesting word again in the original language. It, the word is sozo, S-O-Z-O, -O, and it, it speaks of being made whole. It, it speaks of healing or making well. And the word sozo can be used also for, for salvation as well as for healing. And so that's what he's speaking about here. He's saying it can heal them and make them well. The elders anoint, they pray with faith, and God is able to heal that person. And we leave it in the hands of the Lord. If there's anybody in, in our church that I know for sure wants to see God heal people, I'd have, to, I'd have to say it would be me. My mom, when I was four years old, my mom suffered an epileptic seizure for the first time. My brother was six and I was four. We were playing in the front room, my, my, my dad's house, at our, my parents' home in the front room. We had a little pocket door. My mom would close it and she, I had a sister named Madeline who was a year old at that time a little over a year, my mom would actually bathe her in the kitchen because she could turn the oven on and warm up that small room. And so she would bathe her in the sink there. And I heard the sound of something crashing, and then the pocket door began to vibrate. And I was four years old, and my brother and I were playing in the front room, and I remember sliding the pocket door open. And when I did, my mother's body fell into the room at my feet so my mom's head was at my feet as my mom was shaking having an epileptic seizure and i remember looking at her as she was vibrating there and shaking and i'd never seen anything like this and i remember pressing my back against the wall and my mom was there and i started praying i was four years old my mom had already been teaching me to pray and i i still remember just saying god God, help my mommy. That's what I was saying. My brother ran out of the room, and he ran across the street. He was six years old, crossed a busy street, ran and grabbed a neighbor, brought her back. Isabel came, and she came into the house, and she, we didn't know what to do. This was, this was, well, we didn't know what it was. Well, my mom had epilepsy, and so I, I, I saw this from the time I was four, and I would pray as a little boy, God, help my mom. And, and, and there were many times that I came home from school, uh, five, six, seven, eight years old. I'd come home from school. My mother would be laying on a couch or on the floor when I walked in the door. And she'd be having a seizure. She had it all the time. She had terrible grand mal seizures. She had them quite often as I grew up. I ended up trying to raise, help my kids, my sisters who were younger than me. I would be babysitting them. I'd have to usher them in another room when my brother would take alcohol and rub it on my mother's forehead. It, we just didn't know what to do, so we'd put alcohol on her as she would come out of her seizures. And, and I went through that for years with my mother. When, when I was 10 years old, my mom, who was 30 at the time, because they had given her medications for her seizures, it had done something to her gums and diseased her gums, and she had every one of her teeth pulled at the age of 30. My mom didn't have a single cavity, but they pulled all of her teeth, and at the age of 30, my mom began to wear dentures from 30 until the day she died. And if there's anybody who's ever prayed for healings, that God would move, it was me. It was me. And I pray, and I would seek God, and I'd say, God, in Jesus' name, I still remember my dad calling me because my mom had my mom got lupus and her body was racked with pain. And and I still remember my father calling me and saying, son, can you pray for your mom? And I could hear my mom in the background screaming in pain. And I I carried this in my heart. 
all the time, all the time, all this pain that I've seen. And God, in Jesus' name, touch my mama. My mom finally fell, broke her back, stayed in a bed for the last year of her life, and finally died in the arms of my sister a few years ago. And I prayed for my mom, and I prayed for my mom, and I prayed for my mom. Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But it's always in the hands of God. God is a healing God. He is Jehovah, the one who heals. And I believe that. But sometimes he doesn't. What does it do? My mom would be in bed and she'd say, son, I feel so useless in the kingdom of God. I said, mama, you are the most praying woman I know. Don't let this become your prison. Mama, use your bed as your prayer tower. You lift me up. You lift my wife up. You lift my children up. Pray and seek the Lord while you're there. But I prayed and I prayed and I prayed that Mama would be healed. If anybody wants to see healing, it was me and it still is. I want to see God heal because I want people to be relieved from the suffering that they go through. But sometimes he doesn't heal. Is it because he can't? No. It's because he chooses not to. Does that make him cruel? No. It makes him wise. He knows what he's doing, and I trust him. God can make us whole, and we are to pray for healing. But we pray that God will do it according to his will. In 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And so we pray, and we say, God, in Jesus' name, you are the healing God. And we pray and we seek the Lord for this, but it's up to him. He says in verse 15, interestingly, if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. In this context, James makes it clear that, that some sins can lead to physical illness. We see an example of this in the healing of a man who was brought to Jesus by his friends. He was paralyzed. And remember, his friends broke open a roof and they lowered this man before Jesus Christ on a mat. Matthew tells us in chapter 9, verse 2 of his gospel that some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven you. Whatever it was that was related to his illness, there was a root, and the root may very well have been something he had practiced that ended up injuring him. His greatest need was to be healed in a forgiving way first, and that's why Jesus forgave him first. He may, not, he may not heal my body, but he has healed my soul. I may limp until the day I die, but I'll walk and jump in heaven, and I believe that, because there's walking, I'll be leaping, and I'll be praising God. And I'll be able to see clearly. I have glaucoma. I'm losing eyesight in my right eye. But guess what? My left eye is fine. But one day both will be perfect when I behold his face. And that's how it is. So whatever you go through, you hand it to the Lord. And you say, God, I want you to heal me. I want you to touch my body. I want to be physically able to do the things that I at one time was able to do without the pain that I feel. But Lord... You've made me more compassionate in caring through these things. I understand some things that I never understood before. And Lord, I'm fine with that. But Lord, in Jesus' name, if you would touch me, oh God, I know you can. I pray that you will. But if you don't, thank you for forgiving me of all my sins because one day I will be with you. Where there is no pain, where there is no sorrow, where there is no sickness, there's only joy. You will wipe away every tear from our eyes. We will behold your face and it will all have been worth it. So thank you, Lord, for the work that you do even through these things. <laughs> Healing is up to the Lord. But forgiveness of sin is guaranteed. One last silly story. My mom was quite a dancer. My mom could dance. She would dance in contests as a young girl. And she used to tell me how she'd win these contests and this and that. 
I have no doubt that she could because mama could dance. She did the jitterbug and things like that. She was from the 40s. And it was quite a kick to watch my mama when she'd get on that, that floor and dance. My dad couldn't dance. My dad had two left feet. He met her at a dance. He couldn't dance. He would move one foot, then move the left foot, then the right foot, and the left foot, and he'd just stand like this. Looked like a robot. And my mom literally would dance around him. I can still remember I'd watch my mom and she'd be dancing. She'd dance around my dad. My dad would just be doing this thing, you know. It was funny. And we'd be, ah, daddy can't dance. Well, mama got ill. She had lupus. Her, her feet and hands were, were uh, gnarled from the prednisone that she, she took. She couldn't move. She was in a bed. Her back was broken. My dad had died in 2001. Mama had been without daddy for 12 years, and every day she asked my sister, where's daddy? And every day, because my mom was going through dementia, every day my sister had to relive the story of daddy going to be with Jesus. And then one day my, my mama died in my sister's arms. She went to be with Jesus. And I gave her memorial service, and I said something like this. I said, you know, I said, I'm just saying something that is sentimental, but not biblical. I said, so please don't try and find a place in the Bible because it's not there. I'm just kind of sharing my heart with you for a moment. I said, you know, Mama used to love to dance. And my daddy couldn't. I said, but I can't help but hope that Mom and Dad are dancing together before the throne of God the way David danced with all of his heart. I pray that Mama and my dad are dancing before the Lord. I said, and my daddy can finally dance because he's in heaven. You see, my hope is not on earth. My hope is in heaven. My hope is in heaven. I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through. Every day God gives us is Beautiful day. Thank you, Jesus. But one of these days, and it won't be long, you know, our backs won't hurt anymore. Our legs won't hurt anymore. Our shoulders won't hurt anymore. Our bodies won't ache anymore. You young people, you have a lot of good things to look forward to, I promise you. <laughs> it won't hurt anymore. We'll be before the Lord. We'll be before the Lord, before his throne. Our hands will be lifted high. Our voices will be in full volume. And we will sing praise to the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world and brought us to be with him in heaven. But until that moment, if we're suffering, we pray. If we're rejoicing, we sing. We take all of these things to the Lord and we thank him for he has taken care of our sin and we will see him face to face and he will wipe those tears from our eyes and we will praise him forever because our God has loved us and sent his son to die on a cross for us so that we could be with him and in that we can rejoice. Our sins have been taken care of by the lamb, Jesus Christ, our savior.